everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk World Talk Show presented by Clickaway Creators. Today we have Mr. Siraj Aziz with us. Siraj is a young lawyer based in Singapore working with Sylvester Legal LLC. He has rich experience in legal research and advocacy. After being called to the Singapore Bar, he started out as a research associate at Singapore Management University with a research focus in international economic law and international arbitration law and practice in Asia. He also served as a legislative assistant to a nominated member of the Singapore Parliament. Now, without further ado, let's dive in to know more about him. So, hi, Shiraz. First of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, Nikhil. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year. Wish you the same. Now, uh, Siraj, uh, it would be really nice if you can tell us something about yourself. Well, I, I thank you for the introduction there. As you said, I did start out uh, in a research position. I then moved into a sort of a public defender role at the Law Society Pro Bono Services Office in Singapore, where I was essentially like sort of a public defender for two years, acting for you know, more than in more than 100 cases for clients both in the state courts and the Supreme Court. I then uh, thereafter went into private practice uh, at Sylvester Legal LLC, where I am now. And now I do a range of work, both uh, crim criminal defense and in commercial litigation as well. And, and I also do a bit of arbitration as uh, uh, just recently. So, so that's the state of play uh, at the moment. I'm still a young lawyer, as you said. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing how this year pans out as we move out, move out of the pandemic phase. All right. So, uh, so I noticed that you started off your career as a public defender doing purely criminal work, and now you have also handled civil and criminal litigation. Why did you choose to make that transition, and how do you make and manage that transition? Well, I was always interested in a variety of areas, a large area, numbers of it. Uh, uh, legal, le sorry, a variety of legal issues. And both during my time uh, as a pupil and then subsequently even in my research associate position. And so for me, what is what was really interesting about the practice of law, particularly as a litigator, is the, is the whole arc of, the, is the whole litigation process. So from the start of identifying a problem and trying to resolve it, finding the right avenues to resolve it, you know, kind of pre preparing the uh, legal arguments, both the research and the drafting of them, and then evoke both, both the oral and written advocacy before a court or a tribunal. So that whole process was something that I found very interesting and enjoyable. And the subject matter was almost secondary uh, to that. And so the skills are very transferable between uh, litigation over different uh, areas of law. And so I've, I felt naturally that I wanted to explore other areas of law beyond uh, criminal litigation, although that is something that is still very dear to my heart, especially uh, pro 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 providing uh, such litigation services pro bono uh, for needy, for, for indigents. Uh, but uh, ultimately, it's, it's about applying the same set of skills I learned as a criminal litigator across a variety of uh, legal problems. And that's what uh, motivated me to, to branch out. Uh, of course, it, there has been a learning curve uh, because you in criminal litigation, you could just confine yourself to knowing a set parameter of a legal material. And then essentially the rest of it was applying that to different facts. But as you as you take on a more, a more generalist position in litigation, you realize that for different areas of law, there are various nuances that you need to understand and uh, the approaches can change entirely depending on some of these nuances. But of course, it's also been very interesting because that therein lies a challenge. And of course the challenge is what keeps you motivated and overcoming that challenge then allows you to feel some uh, uh, satisfaction in having overcome that challenge and keeps you motivated, you know, to, to, uh, to stay on in the world of litigation, especially in an industry where attrition is, uh, it's not, a, you know, high attrition rates are not uncommon, particularly when we talk about the global trend now of the great resignation, as you see in the pandemic. 
So that transition was also support, uh, supported by, you know, my peers and my bosses, you know, both in my previous uh, reincarnation as a public defender and even in my current role at Sylvester Legal LLC. My bosses have supported my transition. They have been confident that I could make that transition from the onset even before I made it and provided me the time and the guidance to make that transition as well. So the environment is equally important uh, in helping me make that transition. All right. So now that we are still uh, in between the pandemic, so the pandemic saw some courts begin moving towards more remote proceedings and availability. Is this sustainable and a possible way to increase access to justice, in your opinion? Well, I think uh, remote proceedings are here to stay. Uh, the question is, how, how do we ensure a judicious use of remote proceedings in suitable uh, circumstances? That, that is part of the challenge. So such proceedings will be suitable where, for instance, uh, there is an urgency uh, for those proceedings and people need to have those proceedings heard quickly to get on with their lives. This could be you know, from protection orders to guardianships, uncontested divorces, and so on. Those sorts of proceedings uh, need to be proceeded with and should not be delayed on account of the pandemic. And remote proceedings are a, a great way to deal with those. Uh, remote proceedings are also a great way to deal with uh, some of the more routine sort of hearings like pre-trial conferences, uh, settlement talks and so on. So, uh, so those will also help to clear up some backlog as well. So remote proceedings can be very helpful. Uh, but of course, there are also some uh, challenges that comes with remote proceedings that we will need to grapple with uh, over time, especially as remote proceedings become a permanent part of the landscape, uh, you know, alongside physical hearings. So one issue would be, for instance, lawyer-client privilege. How do you manage that in the course of, say, a trial? For instance, when I'm not able to turn to my client and have a private caucus with him in the course of proceedings, what would happen in a remote proceeding would be that I would have to stand down the proceedings and then have a private Zoom, maybe Zoom caucus with him, for instance. And that could be even more challenging in the context of criminal proceedings where the, the client may be under the custody of the state and he may not readily have materials with him, as you would say in a civil proceeding where you are dealing with, you know, somebody who was maybe in the comfort of his office or with, with the documents that had been prepared by the lawyer uh, for, so that he could follow the trial. Uh, that will be more challenging in the criminal context. So that needs to be considered how lawyer-client privilege is facilitated in the course of trial without too much of a disruption to the proceedings. Uh, the second issue will be one of accessibility. Uh, this is in, uh, in, in, I can think of two issues here. One is the digital divide in terms of the digital literacy of some of the litigants who come before the court and their access to technology. So we take for granted having good internet connection, having a laptop, even having a smartphone. So there will be litigants who need access to justice, who may not have these things readily available. How do they then access uh, uh, remote proceedings, for instance. And even if they could access remote proceedings, what's the quality of that access? If I'm accessing it on a handphone uh, with low latency in my connection, how's that going to ex affect my interaction with the proceedings? And for instance, if I'm illiterate or I only speak a language that is not readily accommodated by software, how, how is that dealt with? So that's something that needs to be thought about we talk about remote proceedings. And another issue is also the costs that may be associated with procuring that technology for either for the, uh, you know, for the litigants themselves or for witnesses they want to procure. So for instance, even if we were to say uh, remote proceedings are good for allowing witnesses who may not otherwise be able to give evidence to come forward, but it may be something I cannot do, for instance, if I have to pay for the witness to maybe travel from his village to a city square where there is Zoom technology. Maybe I also have to pay the rental for the use of that office space where he's going to sit and give evidence. I may also have to pay for a person to sit there and be a witness and ensure that the witness is not being coached. And all of those costs would have to be 
that might be borne by the litigant. And if he can't bear those costs, he can't have that witness. So with that convenience of technology, we also have to think about the cost barriers uh, it will have on certain categories of litigants. So that's the accessibility issue. Uh, but the third issue, third issue of concern when we talk about remote proceedings uh, really is the conduct of the trial itself, right? Even if we talk about cross-examination, um, you know, there is still scope for instances, there will still be concerns about witness coaching or the fact that the witness is not taking the seriousness of the proceed, taking the proceeding seriously is not as, is not, uh, it's not imbibed the gravity of the situation. For instance, I had a, I had to cross-examine a witness who I managed to catch was in fact uh, trying to vape off screen. He had a vape right next to him and once in a while his head would go to the corner and come back. And at one, at one particular moment, I glanced a, a vape and, and then I had to ask the court to, to tell him to stop doing that. And in fact, there was also a concern of whether there were intoxicating substances in that vape, because then that would affect the credibility of his evidence as a witness, if there was some narcotics or, or you know, if, if, if he was having alcohol on the side instead. So, you know, the integrity of the witness evidence in that, in, in that kind of a case then become, gets called into question. And also how seriously is he treating these proceedings if he's not before a judge physically? And also, you know, nuances from nonverbal cues uh, may be lost if there is weak internet latency, right? And may, it may also give a witness a cynic, an opportunity to cynically say, sorry, I had a lack, and buy himself more time to answer a question that way. So these are the nuances uh, we, that we are concerned about in the conduct of a trial itself uh, when we use that sort of a technology. So, but those are concerns that I believe will be met uh, and do not warrant a view of throwing out remote proceedings altogether just because we have those concerns. They will be dealt with in time. There will have to be a balance in, uh, uh, in, in, in the competing interests. And I'm sure the appropriate protocols will have to be experimented with and a balance will be found there. But I, I believe we will in the, uh, in the future landscape be seeing permanently a mix of remote and physical hearings. And for criminal proceedings in particular, I do think, um, you know, if a person's life and liberty is at stake, he ought to be, uh, there, there ought to be physical elements to that. For instance, if I, if a judge is to sentence someone, uh, you know, to lose his life or liberty, it has to be done in person. So there will be, there will be certain uh, areas of the law where physical hearings should not be dis dispensed with, particularly where the stakes are very high. All right, that was uh, very nicely explained. Now, uh, I would like to ask you, how do you rate the current legal system drive towards increasing access to justice? Is there a tangible moment in closing the justice gap? I think now more than ever, you know, it, it, when we talk about legal histories of many jurisdictions, there has been a very visible push to provide greater access to justice. And if that has not already been provided in many jurisdictions, there's at least a conversation about that. I have to say in my jurisdiction, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress, uh, particularly in, in the past, in the past uh, five to six years, a lot of progress has been made uh, by various uh, stakeholders. So this is the state, this is uh, you know, uh, the legal profession, the bar, academia, and even students now have started doing their own initiatives to help access to justice. So it, uh, I, I'm very optimistic uh, that, the, that the, the direction of travel uh, will, will, be, will be maintained and it will help to close, narrow the gap significantly uh, over time. So for instance, the state in Singapore has revised the criteria uh, uh, for giving legal aid to allow more people to qualify they have uh, poured state money into uh, pro bono legal services that's been provided by the Singapore Bar, the Singapore Law Society specifically. And the Singapore Law Society itself has started to introduce more programs to help people who may fall between the cracks. So for instance, just, just last year, they started a family justice support scheme that actually helps uh, applicants 
who do not satisfy the criteria of legal aid that's been set by the state, but nevertheless, their circumstances warrant the provision of aid. You know, and this could also include, for instance, uh, foreign spouses with Singaporean children who may no longer, you know, for instance, of a foreign bride who may no longer be with a Singaporean husband, but she has to fend for herself and her Singaporean child. So, you know, or migrant workers, for instance. So there are many different constituents who have, been, who have fallen through the gaps, who are now being picked up by various schemes, either directly by the state, by schemes run by the Law Society Pro Bono Services, which, which has also started to uh, create networks of support with other different NG, uh, NGOs who are providing support to various uh, uh, constituents. So they all refer, they can all refer cases to each other. They're all in contact and all of them are coming together to help these constituents, whether they are migrant workers, whether they are you know, foreign brides, as I just said, or whether they are just Singaporeans who have fallen through that, that crack. And we also see even within the bar, a tradition now of providing low bono services where some fees, some nominal fees are charged, you know, but the person is still given legal aid, even though they cannot qualify. So now more than ever, there are many avenues in Singapore for, for a person, for a litigant to get access to justice if they, you know, even if they do not have the financial means. Uh, and that's very encouraging. Uh, and it's also encouraging that the, the bar in Singapore, particularly uh, among the young lawyers, have a strong passion for pro bono work, partly because it fits, uh, it provides them with meaning, and also it provides them honestly with advocacy opportunities they may not otherwise have for some time within the usual hierarchical structures or, or you know, of many law firms. So, so it is optimistic. And I think the gap uh, will be significantly narrowed. At least I can say so in, in, in the context of my jurisdiction. I understand. Now, we, as we all know that uh, time is money and time is money in any profession and in legal, it's most of all. So how do you ensure to make the best use of time as a lawyer? Well, you have to plan, you have to plan your time in terms of who are the people you interact with so that you learn from them and who are the, what are the kinds of cases you take up? You know, are these cases from, are you learning from these cases? Uh, are, these case, uh, are you playing a meaningful role in the resolution of these cases? Are you able to get your client a desire, the desired outcome or something that's close to that desired outcome? I think these are questions you have to ask yourself in how, you, because you spend so much time in this profession on your, on, on, uh, you know, on your work, you have to ask yourself those questions about your work. And of course, the people who you interact with are a very important part of how you, how you, how you get the sense of fulfillment or how you, you gauge your improve, whether you're improving or not by you know, bouncing off ideas from various lawyers you know, or simply getting feedback from them. So, so that's how you ensure that the, the time you use is meaningful. If you feel you are not being challenged, if you feel you're not learning, uh, those are usually signs that you, you need to find, uh, you know, you need to find better ways to to, to make your time meaningful. Uh, and, 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 and that's how you make the best of your time, by creating meaning. And if you don't find that meaning, uh, you know, whether it's meaning for you personally or meaning in a broader sense of serving access to justice, for instance, uh, you know, then that's how you gauge whether you've made the best use of your time. All right, and how do you see uh, your role as a role in facilitating access to justice and how do you balance that with your work? Well, so on, on my part, I still do try to do, pro bono. I still do uh, go for pro bono work. I, you know, I sit on the Law Society Committee, a pro bono committee as well, and I try to contribute there. And of course, I also do provide, like I, I told, told you earlier, some members of the bar provide low bono services. I do that as well to help some of the sandwich class that is not able to, uh, to apply for legal aid, get legal aid, but yet are struggling themselves. Uh, so those are ways I help. And, and, and of course, that is something that will always be a part of my practice because it's all, that's always, uh, you know, 
made me feel a sense of purpose in what I do. It's also a way for me to give back as a, you know, as a lawyer using my skills for, for, for a greater good. And that also gives me meaning. Uh, of course, how do I balance that? First, you need an environment that supports your, 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 your desire to do pro bono work that understands that ultimately, you know, there is a benefit apart from benefit society, there is a benefit for your lawyer and there is a benefit for the firm as well, ultimately. And so you need a cult, you need, you, you want a firm that fosters that culture. Uh, and also you, of course, as a, as a matter of balance, if you, it's always better to do it together with other people. So for instance, if you take on a pro bono case, you know, why not do it with another member of the bar? And, you know, and if two, two minds are applied to that problem or to that case, then each person may have to do less. For instance, if you are talking about a pro bono trial, for instance, um, but you know, or your billable work, you know, uh, how do you manage that? That's that's a discussion you have with your clients, with your boss about how you manage expectations, and ultimately it's doable because many young lawyers are, are doing it just fine. You know, doing pro bono work and juggling billable work, and and these are young lawyers from. You know, even from firms large to small, you know, all sorts of profiles of firms and lawyers are, are doing pro bono work. So that's, that, that, that isn't an impediment. It's really how you, I, I think it's really how you decide to, again, think about how you, you, you want to use your time and whether you're making the best of your time. Thank you so much for sharing such great insights with us. And we look forward to having a chat with you again in the future on some other trending topics in the international legal world. So for our viewers, if you like this chat with Siraj Aziz, please like and share this video and also subscribe to Clickaway Creators YouTube channel to appreciate what we do and you have more coming from the legal space. So this is Nikhil for Lex Talk World signing off. Thank you so much.